Good morning, ministers, deputy ministers, excellencies, dear audience. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to South Caucasus Security Forum, organized jointly by GFSIS Rondeli Foundation, Friedrich Eber Stiftung, and uh, Slovak Strategic Policy Institute, Stratfall. Security Forum has become already a tradition, and we have been gathering here for six years to discuss the security challenges as well as prospects and perspectives faced by our region, the South Caucasus. Um, one does not need to have a special skills to see that the contemporary world is a mess. And indeed, we live in a, um, in a world with a difficult security environment, which appears to be growing even more as the challenges to the post-Cold War world order have taken the form of an open great power competition. The stable Euro-Atlantic space is also changing, and the international mechanisms are questioned. Um, and the West is experiencing a political and ideological crisis of self-confidence. This tension is clearly manifested in a number of regions all over the world, and definitely the South Caucasus is one of them. Thus, I'm delighted to see such a wide audience with your interest towards this gathering from highly qualified experts as well as officials. Many are tired of Georgia and Georgians talking about Russia. But the truth is that the biggest security problems of the South Caucasus are connected to Russia. And it's not only true in our region. Today, it seems that Russia is everywhere. It's Ukraine, Syria, Libya, Venezuela. In Georgia, this is felt especially painfully. Hybrid warfare has become an extremely popular word, especially after Russian aggression in Ukraine in 2014. The term is overused nowadays, but the tactics have been applied against Georgia as early as 90s, and as a result, we face occupation of one-fifth of our territories where ethnic Georgians have been cleansed, ethnically cleansed. Those who have remained in their homes or live uh, along the occupational lines are facing continuous discrimination of different forms. But Russia-related security issues are not limited to aggression only. I would say that Georgia is a safe haven for Russia researchers, as, it, as Kremlin employs the whole toolkit of its hybrid tactics in our country, um, aimed at seeding chaos, inf uh, spreading its influence, establishing itself firmly, circumventing our sovereignty, and uh, showing to the rest of the world that in its near abroad, Russian rules would operate and nobody else. But not everything is gloomy. And despite the aggressive informational warfare against Georgia's European Euro-Atlantic aspirations, the majority of Georgians still continue to support this natural choice. Despite a lack of clarity regarding the specific prospects of promised membership, Georgia continues its NATO integration process, which is happening in reality, even if not institutionally, and this productive security cooperation with the alliance, in addition to the cooperation with the U.S., is an important step towards strengthening the overall resilience. And it's symbolic that, as we talk today, the 10th anniversary of Eastern Partnership is marked in Brussels. The association agreement is essential for Georgia's functional integration with the EU and overall increases engagement and EU soft influence not only in Georgia but in the whole region. We believe that European and Euro-Atlantic integration processes for Georgia are mutually reinforcing, at the same time strengthening Georgia's self-identity as a part of the progressive world. But we should also underline that the situation of fundamental strategic uncertainty, lack of security guarantees, and the constant threat from Russia hampers Georgia's development and is psychologically exhausting for its uh, citizens, creating fertile ground for outside interference. Uh, we recognize that um, aside from the South Caucasus and the rest of the Eastern Europe, there are a number of hotspots around the world which get much more attention and are part of a global security discourse, but our region remains an important hotspot of great power competition, and it will continue to be this way for the foreseeable future because Russians, Russia's ambitions have not disappeared and uh, have not been accomplished. Thus, we believe that the situation in our part of the world certainly deserves to be viewed among the major security concerns of today. 
Understanding our regional situation requires that we consider a range of perspectives. Thus, we have tried to arrange to assemble interesting panels and our distinguished speakers who will present many different views that I hope will inspire interesting discussions and questions from the audience. And with this, um, I will stop. I always try to be short, but then it never happens. Sorry for that. But with this, I would like to thank our partners, um, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and Felix Het and uh, Stratfall, uh, Slovak Strategic Policy Institute, its director, Colonel Zekutsia, and of course, Andrei Zacha, as well as special thanks goes to the Embassy of Republic of Poland to Georgia and Ambassador Marius Maskevich for the support. Thank you everyone for being with us, and with this, um, let me give a floor to uh, Felix Hett, uh, director of um, Friedrich Heber Stiftung South Caucasus. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be short, but I can say that I only have two points. Uh, one is more philosophical and the other one is more technical. So um, welcome on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. It's the second year, year we are taking part in this forum and organizing. I would like to also thank uh, our partners for the good cooperation. And here comes the philosoph philosophical point number one. Um, why do we, did we decide last year to take part in this forum? Um, this answer has, has two parts. Um, first is, this is the thing that Friedrich Ebert Stiftung does all over the globe. We try to um, create platforms for dialogue. And the second part of the answer is, we believe in the potential of Georgia, and to be more precise, in the potential of Tbilisi, not only to be a transit hub for goods, for oil and gas and other uh, goods, but also a transit hub for ideas in the regional expert community. And this forum is an attempt to create the platform for the transit of ideas. Um, for that, uh, if for, for that to work, it's not only um, sort of, it, it, it not only depends on us, but also on you. And here comes the technical uh, uh, part of my introduction. We use an application in this forum, which is, as Andre told me, a Slovak uh, uh, invention, which is Slido. So usually when we open seminars and conferences, we ask people not to be on their phones all the time. Here, Slido, you have a perfect excuse to be on your phone all the time. Because Slido is an app, you can go onto slido.com and enter this uh, hashtag uh, SCSF2019. And this is an opportunity to ask questions or post comments to the audience. Yeah? And the questions will appear on the screen. And if you follow the Slido on your phone, you can also uh, vote for questions that are important and the questions that receive the most votes that they will go automatically up. So please use that. Do not waste your time on spamming us because it is moderated. Uh, so um, uh, if, if, uh, uh, if you want to post there that Felix wears a funny shirt, uh, this, this will not work. Yeah? <laughs> so, but this is an opportunity to engage. Also, we encourage all moderators to have some time in the panel discussion for questions from the audience in the traditional way with microphones and so on. But you can also use the 21st century way provided by uh, Slovak startup business. Yeah? And with that, I would like to turn, uh, I, I wish you a very interesting uh, conference. And with that, I would like to give the floor to our Slovak partner. And thank you very much. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, this is already sixth time uh, when uh, South Caucasus Security Forum uh, takes place as a common project of uh, Stratpol yeah. and GFSIS uh, or Randalik Foundation. 
And uh, I'm particularly happy that it has become such a well-established event forum. For the second time, we have the pleasure uh, to co-organize the conference with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And thanks to their involvement, uh, we have managed uh, to take this forum to another level. And we are going up and up. And uh, we continue with the tradition of inviting uh, state representatives and high-profile experts, speakers from both, uh, from uh, South Caucasus and uh, from outside to interact here. The forum offers a unique place uh, for old friends to convene, but also gives uh, an opportunity uh, to forge new parties, partnerships, uh, friendships. Uh, this forum demonstrates uh, the lasting uh, Slovak and Central European interests uh, in the South Caucasus and Eastern Europe both diplomatic and uh, from uh, the non-governmental community as well. We have managed uh, to far to improve uh, the program this year to offer more interesting and inclusive debate. We now have a more diverse set of topics uh, on the agenda than even before. We are particularly glad that uh, we are discussing topics like the role of media in the security uh, debate or local perceptions of the West. Inclusion of these topics reflects on uh, our focus on the underlying road causes of security issues, highlighting a more comprehensive approach to security. Nevertheless, uh, there is still a long way to go for an open, independent and balanced uh, discussion of the most pressing security issues of the region. This year, we have also aimed to offer more focus panels, uh, stimulating a more substantive uh, debate. For several years, now we are trying to deliver a more gender balanced program. And this year results are best, but uh, unfortunately st still not idle. The inclusion of the breakout sessions last year proved uh, to be the right way. And uh, you'll see this year you will find more, even more sessions uh, to choose from. The sessions are also shorter, with more time in between so you can network and discuss between each other, inspired by the, by the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, let me express uh, my sincere gratitude to the people who made this uh, forum possible. I appreciate a lot of, uh, a lot of our Stratpol sponsors in these projects, namely the International Visegrad Fund and Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Korea. I thank our wonderful organizing partners GFSIS or Rondeli Foundation, namely ECA, Katja, uh, Ketty and Shota, and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, namely Felix and Salome, for the amazing effort in organizing this conference. I would like to thank my great Stratpol colleagues as well, uh, led by Andre, and everyone else who helped with the organization. And as I should go without saying, uh, I'm really delighted uh, that so many esteemed participants and expert speakers showed up. Just because you are what uh, makes this forum as it is, or what is it. I wish you all a much fruitful and pleasant time here at the South Caucasus Security Forum in Tbilisi. Thank you very much. Slovakia, 
And to Robert's right is Misha Darshiashvili, former Deputy Minister of Defense for the Republic of Georgia. So uh, a Pole, a Slovak, two Americans, and a Georgian apparently walked into a bar to talk about the Black Sea. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about? Um, there's, there's many different ways to look at the Black Sea. I was kind of thinking this through in preparation for this panel. Um, one way to look at the Black Sea is as a border region, as a front line, as a place where Russia's interests and the West's interests bump into each other with some countries caught in, in the middle. This in many ways makes it similar to Central Europe and the Visegrad states, so it's great that we have two representatives of the Visegrad states on our panel. Another way to look at the Black Sea is if you look at it from Moscow, you look at it as our lost lake, right? Because if you look at the map of the Black Sea during the Cold War, it was pretty much a Soviet lake. And if you look at it now, you see NATO member Bulgaria, NATO member Romania, NATO aspirant Georgia, NATO aspirant Ukraine, and NATO member Turkey. So it's viewed from Moscow as a place that they lost. Now, I, I certainly am not saying I agree with that perspective, but that's one way to look at the Black Sea. Another way to look at the Black Sea is as yet another laboratory for Moscow's dark arts. Um, it's an area where Moscow is using its A2AD capabilities it's an area where it's using its active measures to undermine the resolve of NATO members, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Romania, as well as NATO aspirants, Georgia, and, um, and, and, and Ukraine. It's also an area where <coughs> Moscow is effectively using frozen conflicts and territorial grabs to extend its area of influence, um, speaking of, of course, Crimea, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. Finally, last but not least, NATO is an area where, uh, the Black Sea is an area where NATO and the European Union find yet another area to disagree about, <laughs> to have a lack of consensus about, although I, I'm beginning to see a consensus forming. And with that, it's, I, I do want to start with you, Bogdan, because I know you recently, to just today, published an article in Polish that was published earlier in, uh, in Project Syndicate on NATO's options. Thank you very much uh, for this next opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to take part in the security forum and not to have a break in uh, my every year participation in either security or European conferences here in Georgia. Uh, but this message that I wanted to deliver at the beginning of our conversation is not connected only with, uh, uh, with this article. It's connected with the current stage of NATO and the current stage of the European Union uh, mm, uh, on the eve of uh, important decisions that will be taken uh, after the European elections uh, in, uh, in Europe and uh, uh, after at the end of the presidency of uh, uh, President Donald Trump, I mean the first term in office of President Donald Trump. So the current uh, set of uh, challenges I would like to describe because uh, what's going on uh, within NATO and within the European Union determines to, to a large extent uh, the approach of those two international organizations to the South Caucasus uh, as a whole and to Georgia mainly. I would say that uh, uh, the annexation of Crimea and uh, illegal annexation of Crimea as well as uh, the invasion of Russian troops uh, into Ukraine's uh, Donbass on one hand uh, and uh, the election of President Donald Trump and the decision of uh, Brits uh, on uh, Brexit, they created a new uh, security environment in which, uh, uh, in, uh, which was described by Jens Stoltenberg uh, recently during his last visit to Warsaw as a paradoxical. And this um, paradox described by Jens Stoltenberg uh, says on one hand uh, about uh, mm, uh, the weekend, uh, weekend uh, 
a political tie between the US and, uh, and Europe, at least at the level of rhetoric, at least at the level of rhetoric, when on the other hand, we have reinforced, enhanced military cooperation that uh, used to be expressed uh, during the decisions of, or by decisions of uh, last uh, NATO summits, uh, beginning with uh, Newport and uh, through Warsaw and ending uh, with, uh, uh, with Brussels summit uh, last year. So there, there is a paradox within the alliance that uh, Stoltenberg uh, describes uh, in uh, such words. Uh, this paradox exists because I have to admit that, of course, we see differences. We see disagreements between NATO allies on important issues such as trade, climate change, the Iran nuclear deal, burden, burden sharing and other issues. And we have to admit that these are differences on important issues. But the paradox is that despite these differences, North America and Europe are doing more together, more together within NATO and on security and defense than they have done for many years. And uh, from the perspective of Poland that hosts right now 4,400 American soldiers in two capacities. I mean, in the capacity of, uh, uh, of NATO and in the capacity of bilateral agreements between Washington and Warsaw, as well as in the f framework of uh, tailored uh, enhanced uh, presence uh, in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, we can see that uh, the other side of this paradox, I mean the practical cooperation and the results of this practical cooperation enhancing the, uh, the eastern flank uh, are visible. The results are, are visible. And there are no doubts that uh, it determines also the perception of NATO as a whole in this part of the world, also in the South uh, Caucasus. On the other hand, we have, uh, we have, we have worries and doubts uh, within uh, um, uh, some countries of, uh, of Europe uh, belonging, to the European, uh, belonging to the European Union uh, connected with uh, uh, this new rhetoric coming from uh, Washington and fears that Europe will have to do more to support its own uh, security. That in this, the, those new circumstances, it will be necessary to go ahead with uh, either new initiatives or with uh, uh, implementation of existing, uh, existing uh, instruments and, uh, and tools. And uh, just after the Brexit, uh, uh, the, the UK's referendum on Brexit uh, in 2016, we observed such a move that uh, within the European Union gave the chance, created the window of opportunity for implementation of those solutions that were incorporated into the treaties before. Let's take into consideration PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation of the European Union. Uh, PESCO that since uh, 2009 was a part of, uh, of Acquis Communautaire. But the, because there was no political willingness to use PESCO for reinforcement of European cooperation, it was a sleeping instrument of the European Union. Let's take into consideration also reinforcement of European Defense Agency that exists uh, for years and uh, it was uh, created in 2004, even before it was included into the, into the treaties. There is a new impulse for European Defense uh, Agency uh, recently. Let's take into consideration long discussions concerning European global strategy that doesn't replace 
uh, European Security Strategy of 2003, but creates a new perspective, a new horizon for the European Union. And let's take into consideration the use of solidarity clause just after, in the aftermath of uh, mm, uh, terrorist attacks in, uh, in France. Those are tools that uh, existed, that were at the table, but they were not taken from this table and implemented because of the crisis within the European Union and uh, uh, because of the lack of political will to do that. But this, because this crisis, uh, in my opinion, uh, was uh, an institutional crisis of the EU in this sphere, has been completed, there is a new chance for even new in instruments that could reinforce the EU's uh, uh, capabilities. First of all, I will mention European Defence Fund. European Defence Fund, Fund uh, mentioning also that uh, it was uh, the initiative of uh, one of the commissioners uh, in the current uh, commission, uh, Commissioner Elżbieta Bienkowska I had the privilege to be one of those who created the preparatory uh, concept of this, uh, of this uh, fund. Let's take into consideration also the initiatives of uh, reinforcement of uh, MPCC, I mean uh, those steps that would lead in future to the creation of the operational headquarters of, uh, of the European Union. I don't want to say that there are decisions take, uh, taken that would uh, give us uh, certainty that uh, the EU would go this, uh, this way. But there is a chance, there is a window of opportunity of creation much stronger structure responsible for planning and conducted of, uh, conducting of, the, of European operations uh, and uh, combining efforts in uh, civilian and military sphere. But there are also initiatives that, in my opinion, uh, should, be, should be considered, but that go too far. I mean, uh, especially European Army initiative or the initiative of European uh, autonomy, security autonomy. They were delivered because of uh, this new security situation or new security awareness in Europe after 2016. But ending my in in the introduction, I would say that they go beyond the legal framework of the European Union and ca they can be exclusive, not inclusive, as those mentioned and introduced before. From this point of view, I would encourage European leaders rather to, uh, to use better existing uh, instruments, existing tools, and to create only those instruments that would reinforce common security and defense policy of the EU, not to go beyond the structure of the EU, because it can happen that it would undermine the cohesion of the European Union. Thank you.
not very technical type. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of being here today. It's really a great priv privilege uh, to be in Belize again and particularly to be a part of this conference. Uh, I'm very happy that my country, Slovakia, has such a strong footprint here in Belize. First of all, thanks to, to co-organizers, to Stratpol, but also uh, we as a state institutions are trying to be to be active. So today we have two deputy ministers, my friend uh, Mr. Ruzicka, the deputy minister of foreign affairs, and me, uh, deputy minister for defense here. So we consider Georgia as one of the most important partners in in, in uh, east uh, in the, within the eastern partnership uh, and with a great significance. Uh, but back to your question. Uh, in NATO, there is always a kind of strategic competition between two strategic territories. The northwestern part, which is the Baltic Polish uh, vector, I would say, and uh, the second is the, the, the Black Sea region. Uh, we have to say that all of those crises which, which happened uh, recently, uh, direct or under and under a context with the Russians, uh, all of those things happened here in the Black Sea Basin. Uh, the dramatic shift between uh, or the dramatic shift in uh, European security architecture, which started in 2008, also started here in the Southern Caucasus uh, with the Georgian-Russian war in August 2008. Uh, it's not a Georgian failure uh, or fail that in Europe it was uh, underestimated and uh, considered to be something which is which is a one case issue and not a, a start of a systematic change in Russian foreign policies and security policies. But again, when the wake-up call came in 2014 by annexation of Crimea and uh, and uh, operations in, in Lugansk and Donetsk, it also happened here in the Black Sea Basin uh, in, in Ukraine. And if we go through all of those occupied territories, entities, illegal, illegal annexations and, and Russian military postures, uh, if we conf compare uh, the, the Baltic, uh, Baltic region and the Black Sea, uh, all of them from Transnistria, Crimea, Lugansk, Donetsk, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, all of all, all are like like a system of pearls around around the Black Sea. Black sea. So uh, um, of course, and if we and if we have a look on the very recent developments, uh, what happened in Kerch, Kerch Strait, kind of first direct direct and and openly admitted contact between between Russian and Ukrainian military forces, it also happened in the Black Sea. Uh, it was openly admitted first time by Russians also, and it gave that new domain, that maritime domain, to this to this whole war and conflict. So, um, uh, despite this fact, uh, the NATO's reactions were faster and probably more accurate and more precise after 2014. I mean, in the in the northeastern domain, in 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 the Baltic countries and Poland, uh, NATO established the so-called in-hand forward presence with direct direct military presence, uh, even if in a rotational basis, in the, in the Baltic countries in Poland. Uh, it's not a, a big force. In each each of those four countries, there is uh, 1,000 1, soldiers, basically, as a multinational force. So we have four times 1,000 soldiers in in uh, free Baltic countries, plus Poland. Plus in Poland, there is an additional American presence, of course. Uh, but the whole concept of the of, of enhanced deterrence by by NATO countries was first uh, first uh, executed basically in in the Baltics. Probably the reason is that there is a place where there is a direct contact, direct land contact between NATO countries and and Russia and Belarus. But, but, but in Black Sea, there is a direct contact, but still it's a maritime contact. There is Ukraine and there is a Black Sea. So uh, the, the NATO's reactions were a bit slower. It took some time, uh, but of course it happened. As, as it was mentioned already, the tailored forward presence in, in mainly in Romania, creating new headquarters, uh, uh, also contributing to the air policing or air defense of Bulgaria and, and Romania were very significant uh, contributions to the regional security. And if we talk about the Black Sea itself, the NATO enhanced its maritime presence in the region, including port visits here in Georgia, but also in Ukraine, in Odessa, which 
which was considered to be as a strong contribution to, to, to the regional security. Of course, it comes with, uh, or it opens another question, if you're talking about the maritime domain and maritime presence of NATO countries here, and this is the Montreal Convention, and there is no need to, to, to introduce the Montreal Convention here in Georgia, uh, which, and, and there were very, how to say, there were very vivid conversations and talks in NATO that, okay, if Russia ignores all of the international rules, agreements, and, and uh, the international norms, has the NATO followed this path and and also ignore international international agreements as a as a reaction and it will be for some for, from for some observers probably a justified reaction. Or the other other option was that NATO is a is a guardian of so called rule based international order and NATO has to keep this path which 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 he kept uh, all the time, so NATO has to to follow the the international agreement, uh, which were which were the basic of European basis of European security for for decades, including the Montreal Convention. Or if we talk about uh, talk about uh, the EFP enhanced former presence in the Baltics, so there is the NATO Russia founding yet, which which limits also uh, the military presence of the allies in the territory of of uh, of new allies, including my country. And the limit is kind of substantial military force, it, as it's written there. And substantial military force, it's a uh, it's kind of brigade size force, which is considered already as a substantial military force. So, the the NATO's answer after yeah, but I mean, how many countries you include? Yeah, uh, but but uh, basically, those those discussions were were uh, were there, and they are still there. But uh, the approach, which which um, which uh, basically follows follows that that so-called international rule-based order uh, has to be has to be acknowledged by NATO and has to be it has to be the basis of its its approach one, and it's still still on the way. So it very much limits the NATO's reactions. I I very much understand the security concern of of our Baltic friends and Polish friends and. We share this view, probably not the same intensity, but the view are exactly the same uh, for for more forces, and and we, we follow those discussions. Uh, I also understand that the the concerns here, uh, and we absolutely absolutely support everything which we, which would enhance the the security. This is basically the line where where, where NATO where NATO should uh, follow. Uh, of course, other dimension to this is the building of partnerships, uh, especially with Georgia and, and Ukraine. Then there is a question how to how to move forward because currently, mainly because of internal positions of, of NATO countries, uh, the, the the how to say more robust approach to NATO enlargement is is kind of slowed down towards this, this, uh, these countries. Uh, and we need to solve this, and uh, there is always that dilemma between between two basic principles uh, of, of uh, NATO towards the towards the enlargement. First, that uh, that uh, no third countries has any veto uh, for for accession of any countries to NATO. It it could be and has to be only decision of that particular country and NATO countries. So no Russia or other country has to have veto veto. And the second principle that that the country which Aspires to goes to uh, aspires for NATO membership has to control or exercise full sovereignty over over its territory, which is which is in contradiction. And all political, intellectual, and I don't know uh, what kind of, of capacities should should focus on this, because if we'll not solve this problem, then they will, we will give just card to to Moscow's hand. It, it's enough to to occupy one square meter of any country. And then, then any any chances are lost. So I mean, we, we cannot we cannot allow this, of course. So uh, very briefly, how how the NATO looks uh, on those on, on, on those issues, and especially to Black Sea, and I'm open for you, for your yeah. questions. Thank you, Robert. And actually, that sets things up very very nicely for me. Here, um, we have a, we've had a bunch of people who do not live in Black Sea littoral states talking about the Black Sea. I actually wanted to bring somebody who is a citizen of a Black Sea littoral state. But Robert raised this issue of. Russian occupation of territories in Georgia and Ukraine, and how this complicates your 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 your, your, your NATO aspirations. It all 
also complicates the security equation in, in the region as well. I know you and I were talking about this a little bit before the panel, and I know you, you had some things to say about that. So, but, but how, how does this complicate the, the, the security situation? Thank you, Brian. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be at this panel and to talk on the issues pertaining to the Black Sea and on uh, NATO's role, how to project the peace and stability in this uh, very important uh, region. Uh, and the timing for this discussion couldn't be better. So having in mind that in April, just a few weeks ago, uh, NATO foreign ministers agree agreed to step up their efforts on the Black Sea. And also the upcoming NATO summit in London presents a very good opportunity to evaluate the progress uh, and uh, make further steps forward to enhance security and deterrence and defense of this very important region. Well, security and stability of this Black Sea region has been uh, significantly undermined by the Russia's invasion, occupation, and annexation of Georgia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, as we speak, uh, just 40 miles from this very nice hotel, Russians brutal Kremlin regime occupies more than 20% of the Georgian territories. Russian occupying forces on a regular basis arrest, detain, and tarnish rights of the Georgian citizens, and barbed wires separate Georgian families there. Along with the ongoing uh, creeping annexation, uh, Georgia uh, is facing ongoing very harsh hybrid warfare from the Russian Federation and ECA very eloquently presented all the key aspects of this hybrid warfare. And it's happening because of our choice, and it's happening because of the choice of the Ukrainian people to develop democratic states, states with solid state institutions, with a solid civil society, free from corruption. And it's happening because of our sovereign choice to go back to the families of democracies with whom we share our own identity, values, and principles. It is my firm conviction that having Russia paid sufficient price in 2008 for its invasion and occupation of Georgia, we wouldn't have faced such dramatic developments in Ukraine uh, just a few years later. Well, needless to dwell on the importance of the Black Sea, it is a very important region which connects Mediterranean Asian and the Caspian Sea and uh, represents a very important passage to the Middle East. And to, uh, uh, frankly, by my opinion, and I'm sure most of you will agree that for many years Black Sea has been left without due attention, from the NATO especially. If we go back and look at the official documents of the alliance, whether it's summit communiques, summit declarations, or ministerial communiques, uh, well, we could only find a very brief sentence highlighting the importance of the Black Sea. Uh, there was also an illusion created about the existing formats of cooperation, Black Sea for later than uh, Black Sea Harmony, that these uh, formats could provide any tangible security and cooperation on the Black Sea, but unfortunately, none of these formats could prevent Russian Federation from invading and occupying two little states, Ukraine and Georgia. And recent military buildup, uh, what we're experiencing in, uh, in, uh, in the occupied territories and in the Black Sea, by Russia represents significant security threat not only to the region but also to the Euro-Atlantic alliance and the Euro-Atlantic security architecture. Russia's goals uh, is clear. Uh, Russia wants to draw a dividing line in Black Sea. Russia tries to constitute uh, uh, and validate its uh, claims for the spheres of uh, exclusive influence and of course NATO, and we all shouldn't allow them to do so. Strategic goal of Europe, whole, free, and at peace uh, will not be and cannot be accomplished without security of the Black Sea area. Well, there are very encouraging signs, and uh, we've seen these signs uh, from Robert's uh, remarks that uh, NATO, starting from the Wales Summit and even more from the Warsaw Summit, that there are tangible steps in regards to the strength and NATO's uh, efforts on, on the Black Sea. Uh, we've seen uh, 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 maritime presence, enhanced maritime presence. We see the multilateral uh, uh, land presence in, in Romania. 
Also, we see air patrols of the airspace of Bulgaria and uh, uh, Ro Romania. Uh, however, uh, in my opinion, uh, without moving forward with enlargement on the Black Sea region, without inviting Georgia and Ukraine to join the alliance, uh, it will be very difficult to create real elements of the deterrence on the Black Sea region. Uh, if I may also very briefly to talk about Georgia's NATO membership process. Uh, well, 2008 was very important for our membership uh, path when NATO allies agreed and they made a commitment that Georgia will become a NATO member. And uh, Georgia's uh, uh, cooperation with NATO uh, contains all the necessary tools, and these are not my words. These are the words which has been agreed by the NATO allies. And when we talk about the tools, first and foremost, we have to highlight the annual national program, which is the part of the membership action plan, which we are missing in our NATO membership process. And if we dismantle this tool map, uh, we can clearly see that we have both of its elements. We have political part, Bucharest summit commitment, and we have practical part annual national program. And on top of that, we have NATO Georgia Commission, which plays the central role and supervises uh, Georgia's NATO membership process and NATO Georgia substantial package, which includes 14 very important elements. Uh, well, in 2008, uh, I was a junior diplomat accompanying Georgian delegation to Bucharest. And that time, of course, the membership action plan was very high in the agenda. And unfortunately, NATO failed to deliver membership action plan to Georgia, and mainly this was a political decision. So and when we realize currently and analyze where we stand with a NATO membership process and what's missing in this process, uh, the only thing what is missing is the political decision. And in concluding uh, of my remarks, I want to bring to your attention very recent statement of former NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen. Just a couple of weeks ago, he published an op-ed dedicated to the uh, NATO ministerial. Uh, in his, uh, uh, his op-ed, Secretary General uh, wrote, and I quote, recent history shows that every time NATO has, the third Russia has moved in. For example, in April 2008, NATO allies met in Bucharest to discuss offering membership action plan to Georgia and Ukraine. At the insistence of Germany and France, we decided to postpone the decision until the end of the year. In my view, that was a mistake. Just a month after the summit, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev or ordered to the invasion of Georgia and Russia occupies Abkhazia and South Ossetia even since. So. The London summit represents a unique opportunity not to repeat the same mistake and to come up with a concrete strategy regarding the Black Sea and enlargement uh, as an internal element of the strategies. Thank you.
Waltz said they want to balance. They would go to their incapabilities, or they would fire these two partners and allies to counter threats. Steve Waltz countered that states want to balance, but the weaker they are, the less capable they're going to be of doing that. They're not going to be able to build up their own forces sufficiently. They're not going to be able to sell themselves to allies very well. So they sometimes have to do what um, was kind of bandwagon, right? go along with the threat these states that feels good for them out there. <coughs> Because weak states not only survive, as Alexander Langelli wrote, but they do affect international relations in their own right. And their efforts to find allies and alternatives and to create security for themselves, they also shift on a global balance. So over the last three decades or so, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia's and Ukraine's security situations have overlapped and diverged uh, at different times. For Georgia, Georgia's independence began in the 40s, times of war. And that war ended with parts of Georgia, Kazi and Georgia, de facto independent. Tbilisi did not control those territories, hasn't controlled them since the early 90s. Now, is Russia responsible for that? Russia certainly played a role in that. Arguably, Georgia um, would have held on to the territories if it hadn't been uh, for Russia's involvement. It's also very understandable that since that time, Georgia didn't really have a lot of a choice but to see Russia as a threat. Russia had those a threat. And Russia, for its part, saw the United States and the West, which it saw as the whole United States, as a threat, which meant that it looked at every relationship that anybody else had with the United States as part of the standoff between Russia and the U.S. Um, the U.S. genuinely did not see things that way. So you have this interesting dynamic where the Georgians are courting the United States, looking for a relationship with the United States that is hard to balance Russia and was hard to balance. And the United States is interested in the friendship with Georgia in part because it doesn't think this was about balancing Russia. If it really was convinced that this was about balancing Russia, that U.S. relations with Georgia were the threat that upset Russia, well then the United States might have been less interested in relations with Georgia. Now because the Russians saw the Georgians as different sides, and because the Russian because the Georgians saw themselves as trying to acquire a partner and an ally against the Russians. Um, Russians were pretty sure this was going to eventually lead to war. Um, and I, I mean, I remember this. I remember in the early 2000s going to Russia and being told by Russian analysts over and over again, most likely cause for conflict involving Russian forces is something along the line of Georgia. 
And what they do, what they, what they succeed in doing is finally convincing a lot of people in the United States and Europe, yeah, okay, we are in a standoff. Uh, this, is, uh, this is East against West, or Russia against the rest, as Angela Stent uh, recently titled her book. Um, and from the Georgian perspective, this is kind of almost fantastic because if the West is going to stand with the Ukrainians, then surely it's going to stand with Georgia. Surely it has to. The Georgians have been doing this for a long time. This is kind of the argument that Misha just laid out, that this is what the Russians have been doing. They've been doing it all along. It's up to the West to defend and support all of these countries that are at risk. There's two problems with this narrative. The first is that um, the United States doesn't seem to be all that interested in the standoff, even if parts of the American establishment have been convinced it's there. Um, problem is that Donald Trump is the third American president in a row to come into office saying that he's going to limit American involvement overseas. Um, now, he's been less successful in limiting it than in making it less predictable and less consistent, certainly less consistent with past policies. But it does speak to a certain lack of an American desire to shoulder the burden of everybody else's security. This also is part of a broader realignment um, of global forces, which I would argue U.S not just U.S. withdrawal more recently, but the way that U.S. foreign policy has been pursued over the last 15 years or so has been pushing us in that direction. So countries are realigning, which means that the old alliances and the old structures and the old relationships may mean less. So if a decade ago there was an argument for NATO as a video game that if you, you, know, if you eat enough dots, you get to the next level and the next level and the next level and finally get to membership, this notion of what is the alliance for is something that's really being asked by a lot of alliance members, and it's not as clear. And this isn't about Russia. Uh, it's about the alliance itself. And then there's the other piece of this, which makes it really hard to put this as a matter of let's just pick sides and move forward. Somebody reminded me recently that peace is most sustainable after a war. Peace is most sustainable when one or the other side has been soundly defeated. Problem is, this isn't really an option here. Sin since nuclear weapons came into, this, came into this world, it hasn't been a good option for anything involving nuclear weapon states. The notion of the sound defeat of one side or another is a very, very bad idea for all of us. We all die. So somehow, we need to find a way to muddle through it all that doesn't put us into that standoff, that gets us out of the standoff. And that's going to be a really tough way to go. And for small countries that are trying to assure their security in a time of great fluctuation, they have the capacity to influence the big powers. But they also should ask themselves what they're asking for and what's going to grant them uh, greater security in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Olya. And that sets us up nicely for the, where I want to go next, which also, interestingly enough, overlaps with one of the questions that's on our magical, super-duper 21st century, high-tech Slido uh, screen there. Uh, and that is, is it, is it better for Georgia to market itself as a Black Sea country than as a South Caucasus country? And this got me thinking as I was looking at this and, and, and thinking about it. And thinking about conversations I've had in, in, in Washington with other friends of Georgia who are trying to think of how to break this logjam on Georgia's NATO application and how to market Georgia better in this, in, 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 in this process. And one of the things, particularly um, my friend and colleague, General Ben Hodges, thinks that we need to market Georgia as a, not just a security consumer, but a security provider and actually as one of the one of the anchors along with Romania on the Black Sea because if you look at the Black Sea and you think well yeah the Turks are NATO members but they're not always really completely down with the uh, the, the idea of deterring Russia in the Black Sea same goes for Bulgaria but with Georgia there is no question 
And with Romania, there is no question. So that's one way to market Georgia as a security provider and not just a security consumer. The other way is economics. And this is something, another thing General Hodges and I have had a lot of conversations about, and that's the, the deep water port at Anaclia that is being built at this time. Um, a lot of people think that this could be Georgia's ace in the hole in terms of security, because this port could be a key asset in east-west trade. And therefore, it will turn Georgia itself into a very valuable asset that therefore must be protected. Um, Misha, I wanted to get your take on that. Do you think this is a, a smart way to change the conversation about, about Georgia's NATO membership? Uh, thank you, Brian. Well, uh, first of all, Georgia has been acting like a NATO ally for, for many years. I, so I think we've proved that. But I'm talking we, about marketing. Yep, and yep. Not, not we reality. are cap very <laughs> capable uh, providers of the security and stability of the Euro Atlantic uh, and uh, Europe. Uh, as we speak, nearly 900 Georgian soldiers are deployed in Afghanistan under the Resolute Support uh, Mission, and uh, Georgian and American soldiers have fought shoulder to shoulder uh, for the common cause. Well, when it comes to the marketing itself, the, uh, it's really hard for me to say which angle is the better, but Georgia uh, has been trying to market itself as a democracy in the country which is capable of providing security and stability. Of course, in terms of the logistic potential, Georgia bears huge potential. And of course, the deep sea port in Aklia, uh, is a very important element of it. And once this uh, project gets finalized and uh, uh, starts running, Georgia's value as a logistic hub will significantly grow. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, Georgia Ministry of Defense conducted the first ever exercises, logistic exercises. I think it's the first time, and the logistic elements, the creation of the logistic hub in Georgia was the part of substantial NATO Georgia package. So yes, logistic importance of Georgia is very high, and uh, I'm personally very thankful for the statements of the General Hodges, who is a great friend of Georgia and a great friend of the Alliance. Yeah. Yeah, the general's fond of saying we need to get Georgia into NATO yesterday, <laughs> which is um, uh, Bogdan and, and Robert. What do you, how do you, how does this look like from your capitals? Do things like Anaclia make Georgia more marketable? We all know the contributions Georgia is making to NATO, but selling that, knowing that, and actually selling it to a skeptical alliance is another, are two entirely different things. Certainly, but I, I I just want to want to to follow up what was already already said that that uh, the Georgian and very significant Georgian deployment to Afghanistan and contributions to, to to operation in Afghanistan contributed very very positively to to Georgia's image as a security provider. So it was uh, for for many years when Afghanistan was the 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 Lacmus paper of, of uh, assessing the allies, uh, I don't know, will to contribute for, for more than a decade. It was very highly appreciated and, and it's still very highly appreciated, of course. Uh, second thing which is, which is very important, that basically Georgia is the, is the most well-functioning democracy in the broader regions here. It's uh, probably, it's not, uh, I, I don't know how much it's, it's uh, like appreciated uh, uh, when, when we are talking here, but but from European perspective, it's it's uh, it's a very important very important part of Georgia's uh, positive image. Uh, it's it's uh, that that it's the only uh, full scale democracy basically in in the broader region of, of of Caucasus. I would not say that that those two geographical identities, Black Sea identity versus South Caucasian identity, are competing somehow. It's not so important. I mean, uh, the, it, it, Georgia is where it is geographically, so nobody can move it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and everybody who is looking at the map and who thinks in, in geographical terms can understand uh, the geopolitical situation. Uh, the, the problem is not the positive image of Georgia, probably, but the domestic political dynamics in some European countries, I would say, if you are talking about, and not only uh, European countries, but uh, mainly uh, if you are talking about uh, future membership. 
uh, but the image in general, I guess, the Georgian image in, in Europe uh, from this perspective is, is absolutely, absolutely positive. First, strong contributor, well-functioning democracy, and, uh, and uh, uh, contributor in general to, to regional and NATO security. Bogdan, what do you think? Do, is, is, does, does, does the, the port in Anaklia it's very Can difficult to use as an asset to, to, it's to enhance Georgia's security. Very difficult to uh, repeat what was said before. <laughs> uh, I would add only one small issue that uh, should be taken into consideration. This is the cooperation between special operation forces uh, mm -hmm. of the United States and uh, and uh, and Georgia. Uh, not only contribution to the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, not only stable democracy, not only open uh, free market, but also uh, various uh, dimensions of cooperation with, uh, with allies and partners, allies within NATO, partners uh, within uh, the EU, but mainly between special operation forces of uh, the United States and Georgia also to some extent between Polish uh, Special Operation Forces and Georgian Special Operation Forces. Well, your thoughts on this, and also I, it seems yeah. to me if, if my, my terrible 56-year-old yes. eyes seem to think there's a, there's a question directed at you, I can't see it's that It's also hard to see. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I can, my 40, almost 49-year-old eyes can just about see it. Um, so I think uh, a couple of thoughts that are related to both to the question you asked and to the question on the board for me. I'm gonna say that I wonder if one can argue that having forces in Afghanistan makes one a security provider, given the um, overall trajectory of that endless conflict. Um, I don't know if anybody's forces in Afghanistan are providing security for much of anybody uh, these days. I do think it speaks to this notion of, you you know, George, Georgia's fake it till you make it model of, uh, of NATO membership, which, you know, countries tend not to be all that grateful. I mean, that, that's kind of the problem. That's not how this works historically. Historically, great powers like the United States tend to think that uh, you're with us because you want to be with us, and if you want things, if there are asks, so to speak, then, well, gosh, you know, surely you want to show up in Afghanistan of your own security interests, whatever those were, and that can't possibly be because you wanted something from the Americans, and surely the Americans don't owe you anything for it. Now, that's not, everybody in the United States is not gonna say that, but that is how countries tend to behave, including um, the United States. I do, however, wanna echo, Robert, on the concept of Georgia as a functioning democracy, which is also, might be a bit of a low bar these days, what a functioning democracy is, we're all having a bit of trouble, but um, in that context, Georgia does pretty well, and, when the original question, which is about European aspirations, you know, there's the geographical definition of Europe, and there's the sort of identity, values-based, whatever definition of Europe, which some countries that geographically fit nicely into Europe don't seem to fit very well. But Georgia is working on it. And so I'd, I would argue that rather than making asks of the United States, Georgia really should press on with this notion of we don't do this to get into NATO. We don't do this to get into the EU. We do these things, democracy, economic reform, political reform, democracy, social justice, human rights, because they're good in and of themselves, because they're good for our country, because this is the country we want Georgia to be. And wow, export that. That would actually be great for the United States and for a lot of Europe if you could. The extent to which that is the ideal that takes hold of Georgia and that is the ideal that's pushed forward in Georgia, that's going to make this country healthier and it's going to make the rest of us healthier too. Thank you. I'm actually looking, I guess if it's in blue, it's a popular question. Is that, is that, uh, is that, is that the way I should interpret that? Because there, there seems to be a, a question about the kind of the future of GOOM, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova. There used to be Guam. Um, which included uh, which Uzbekistan. Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan. in Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan, but now I should Georgia be pooling its 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 uh, its, its its efforts with Moldova and Ukraine, and to what extent and what form should this take? I guess Misha, do you want to do you want to tackle that one? 
Well, if I, if I read correctly, the question uh, stresses that whether the uh, Georgia, Moldova, and uh, Uzbekistan can together work, or Ukraine can work together to uh, eliminate threats, uh, uh, threats, uh, but uh, this format can be used for cooperation, for creating uh, economic benefits, cultural benefits, but I'm very skeptical about the value of this cooperation when it comes to the bringing deterrence and uh, defense on the Black Sea and the neutralizing the threat that comes from, uh, from the Russian Federation. I want once again reiterate that the, there is only one capable organization which can bring stability and security to the Black Sea, and it is NATO. And sooner Georgia and Ukraine join NATO, better it will be not only for the Black Sea region, but also for entire year Atlantic security. Thank you. Just very briefly, it reminds me of this question, our situation in the early 90s when when uh, there were concepts in Central Europe, or especially in Slovakia, to to uh, consider the V4, the Visegrad 4, the cent cooperation of Central European countries as something alternative to, 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 to the way to NATO and the EU, and, and that, that V4 v should provide Slovakia for, for, or not Slovakia, but the member countries, uh, and it could give some, some protection or, or defense and, and, I don't know, progress for for economic uh, or, or, or cooperation, I don't know. Uh, and but those those things were never real. I mean, those formats, regional formats, are very useful for cooperation for for many kinds of cooperation from defense to culture to economy. But simply, they don't have the potential to provide a real security guarantees. So it, it, we had this debate. In, in, in Central Europe, and uh, and they are appearing all the time, but simply the numbers are not giving you the real the real uh, outcome. And we, any without any advice, but uh, <coughs> I would like to underline that this is absolutely crucial moment for uh, advocating uh, Georgian interests within the European Union or the co within the framework of cooperation with the European Union because of the negotiations of the next multi-annual financial framework of the EU. We are at the end of this process. We are at the beginning of the process of creation new leadership of the European Union. And uh, this is the time frame in which the future seven years uh, perspective will be, uh, will be, uh, will be decided. Uh, uh, and the EU takes seriously in, into consideration because it has to take it into account seriously upgrading funds uh, allocated for the neighborhood policy. It was, uh, it was difficult, uh, uh, often impossible to do anything with uh, uh, stabilizing the neighborhood and uh, reinforcing uh, cooperation with partners in this neighborhood uh, when the EU had only 10 billion euros f uh, during the last seven years for neighborhood, both dimensions of neighborhood. I mean neighborhood policy in the east and neighborhood policy in the, in the south. Now those funds will be will be upgraded and the discussion is how much the EU will be able to allocate for neighborhood policies. So this is one of the dimensions that uh, encourages uh, Georgian authorities uh, to be uh, proactive uh, at this time. At this time, this year, before the before the selection of new leadership of the, the European Union, and during the crucial debate on the future multi-annual framework uh, in finances of the EU. Thank you, Bogdan. I, I'm looking at a question, and I'm, I'm imagining how my fellow panelists are going to react to it. I think we all know the, the, the question I'm talking about. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to look at Russia as a friendly partner rather than an enemy? Um, I, I know how I would respond to that because I, I, I believe what, what Russia wants from Georgia is something no Georgian is willing to give, and that's Georgia's sovereignty. 
Um, but I'm going to turn this over to, I guess we first go to Misha with this one because I, 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 wanted, I did not want to avoid that question. Well, I think over the history, we are very good at choosing our friends. Uh, we can choose our friends, but not, unfortunately not our neighbors. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Uh, being friends with Russia means uh, sacrificing our sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's simply impossible. Uh, our history of dealing with Russia goes beyond uh, many, many years, and you cannot name any single agreement which was fulfilled by the Russian Federation. They've been always violating agreements and they were always trying to tarnish our sovereign rights to be independent, to be sovereign, and to pursue our foreign policy goals. Within current configuration, it is simply impossible. So I think, um, Russia. I agree that Russia's not looking for a friend in Georgia. Uh, Russia doesn't Russia doesn't tend to look for friends. It doesn't tend to believe that great powers have small power friends. It believes that great powers have small power vassals. Uh, so friendship isn't really an option. On the other hand, dialogue has to be. And I think Georgia has actually pursued a very smart policy towards Russia in recent years, which is the recognition that Russia is a neighbor. And you have to deal with the Russians. And it's something of a constant negotiation. That's not friendly partnership. It's a rec and it's not advers ideally it's not adversarial either. It is a recognition that interests are different, and that they can, you know, they can be sorted through and pursued, and that everybody wants to avoid the use of force. Again, it's not an easy path because it never gets fully solved. It's this continuing challenge and a continuing problem. But because you can't move either Russia or Georgia, uh, I think that's, that's how it's going to keep going. And so that's, so dialogue but not friendly partnership, I think, is the, uh, is the answer. Robert Bogdan, any, any thoughts on this? No? There is, there is that great song, It Takes Two to Tango, you know? Okay, we literally have... We literally have five minutes, so... Uh, what, what do I, I have two? All right, <laughs> no, that, that would be too much. <laughs> we literally have five minutes, so I guess we will go to the floor now, and I see one question in the front. We please keep your questions brief and have a question mark at the end, please. Hi. Um, Turkish Ambassador Fatma Ceren Yazgan, and a lot of references to Turkey, and I will not dwell on your comment regarding Turkey's commitment to NATO as a member. Uh, obviously we are, and in Afghanistan, who's covering the Kabul airport, you'll remember, if you land in Kabul. Um, now, on, on my question, uh, they actually marketing to whom, Georgia? For instance, Turkey as a neighbor, a NATO member, a Black Sea country, a regional uh, power, we are committed to the NATO membership of Georgia. We're not actually questioning why, how, and so on. We say tomorrow, today, let's do it. Now, who should you be marketing to Georgia? At the Georgian regional aspect. It is a Caucasus country, it is a Black Sea country, it is a wider, from Black Sea to Caspian country. So, who are you looking for to market Georgia as Black Sea, as Caucasus, as whatever. Um, my question is, well, who should be our clients to market further? Thank you. I would, I would address that by saying one needs to look no further than the Bucharest summit and those countries that favored Georgia's uh, receiving map at Bucharest and those that did not. Those that did not would be those that need convincing and therefore those would be the targets of any marketing. But I will let Misha go with this because it's your country. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. First of all, I would like to highlight how important for Georgia is our strategic partnership with Turkey, and we are grateful for your continued support to Georgia's NATO membership. And uh, I personally, when I worked at NATO, remember your very strong positions uh, vouching for Georgia's uh, NATO membership process. As I mentioned in my earlier remarks, uh, Georgia has been trying to brand itself as a democratic country as well as country which is capable of providing security and uh, stability and uh, I fully agreed with Brian's comment that main targets for us were those countries who were 
skeptical not to the Georgia's NATO membership process itself, but to the pace of, of uh, accepting Georgia. Of course, we would love to see Georgia as soon as possible, but there are few NATO member states which think that there are things ahead of that. So. And do, we, do I see any other hands out there, or are we at, a, at the end? Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, good morning, Tengiz Uh I have a question. I have just a very short comment about Georgia and Russia relations. Uh, almost 30 years I spent in Georgia foreign policy. Uh, so when it comes, uh, would Georgia love to be Russia's good friend? You know, uh, friendship is a very usual thing for Georgians. The question is about Russia. Uh, since very, very beginning of our relationships, it, and this is very wrong to think that conflicts in Georgia starts because of NATO. Conflicts in Georgia start in the first day of our independence. And the hybrid war was in Georgia in the very beginning of the 90s. Then we signed a number of agreements with Russia. And we became a member of, including CSTO and Customary Union. But, uh, it didn't start the conflict. It didn't bring any security guarantees, neither for Georgia nor for this region. So that's why when we're comparing uh, and uh, uh, talking that is uh, the way to NATO or way towards some more friendship relationship for Russia, that's a, not a right comparison. Because uh, the only way to develop country is to be democratic country, with market economy, human rights, and so on. This concept for Russia is a threat. So that's the main problem. And, and if we recognize this, we can unite our force to prevent and protect Russia. But the problem is that Russia today didn't pay any political price for occupation of Georgia, for this creepy occupation, for kidnapping, and so on, so on. So until the West is not united, didn't see that this is not a threat for the single tiny country, this is threat for the uh, international world, unless we will enjoy uh, occupation of Georgia, occupation of Crimea, uh, Donbass, and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Tengiz. As, as I listen to you, <laughs> listening to your comment, I'm reminded of the words of the late, great Leonard Mary, the first post-Soviet president of Estonia, who said, you do not turn a bear into a vegetarian by feeding him meat. Um, we have literally time for one more question, if there is one, and if there isn't, we will, we will wrap it up. I don't see any hands, and we're exactly on time, being very German here. Um, I would, uh, let, let, why don't we give a, a round of applause to our, to our panelists. Um, on. Thank you very much, and I, I hope the coffee is ready. <laughs>